All right, I think we are, it's time to get started, yeah? Okay, uh, welcome back. Uh, we're talking about living with a biblical worldview. Uh, tonight we're going to look at something different, kind of a strange thing, um, epistemology. Where do we get knowledge? Um, <laughs> it's kind of an interesting thought. Uh, just, this, this jumped in my mind, I'll touch on it a little bit later. Um, if we're talking about basically two, basically two schools of thought when it comes to worldview, it either includes God or it doesn't include God. Um, so one basic uh, ideology comes from the fact of creation. So we believe that God created and he's still actively involved in what's happening on the earth. And the other one is an evolutionary process where nature kind of controls things and we go from there. My thought was, um, well, if you had this happy little amoeba that was living life, why did he develop knowledge? I was just a thought. <laughs> I mean, why not just stay a happy little amoeba and not worry about anything, right? I mean, so why do we have this development of knowledge? Um, so yeah, so it's kind of an interesting question. Where we get knowledge does have a huge impact or influence on our worldview. Um, this probably could have been the first lesson, but I thought we needed to establish some parameters with God and creation and evolution, things like that, because it ties into it. Um, uh, we've been talking about the total sum of our experience, which determines our worldview. Everything we experience in life okay, brings us to that place where we view things and we make decisions based upon those things that are in our life. Okay? Um, it's a foundational principle. Um, a little bit of a new definition for worldview. Dr. Jeffrey Ventrella, the Alliance Defending Freedom, says worldview is a network of presuppositions or beliefs through which one interprets all human experience. Um, we all have a certain set of beliefs or disbeliefs, if you will, um, that uh, kind of daily guide us to the decisions we make for life. Okay, um, but where did that knowledge come from? <laughs> that's the question. Um, so that's kind of this area that we're talking about tonight with epistemology, the idea of, or the definition of epistemology is the study of the origin or limitations, the definition of knowledge. Russell Lou questions, how do we know what we know? Uh, that last part really kind of establishes the direction of this lesson. How do we know what we know? But I thought there was a second question. There's a second question. Why do we know what we know? Um, again, um, uh, two basic principles. Evolution of some kind, whether you think that there was a intelligent designer that created and then left the earth and let it evolve on its own or you're talking about, you know, the Big Bang Theory where evolution started and everything went from there and we've developed over time. 13.8 billion years was the last I've heard. Of course, that could have increased now because of the James Webb Telescope. Might be more years. Wait till next week. We'll see. I don't know. Wait two weeks. It might be even more. Less. Who knows? Because they don't know. Um, but anyway, so this idea of evolution, um, like I said, why didn't this happy little creature stay just a happy little creature? Why did he have to develop? I mean, if, if, he, if there was nothing to interfere with its life, nothing to preclude it from living the way it wants to live, so why did it develop knowledge? Why did it develop into other creatures? It kind of makes no sense, but the second idea is creation. God created and continued and continues today to be involved in the world. He gives us knowledge. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. Um, some factors we have to take into consideration. Um, this is one of the arguments that goes around, uh, again, in philosophical discussions. Um, nature versus nurture. Okay? Um, nature versus nurture is the debate centers on the contributions of genetics and environmental factors to human development. Um, you have two schools of thought, nature. Um, Plato and Descartes, a philosopher, says certain factors are inborn and occur regardless of environmental, environmental influence. Wait a minute, that's a problem. That's a big problem because they're saying that there's no environmental influence on nature. But the, wait a minute, then what is evolution? I mean, isn't that an intrusion on nature? I mean, they're saying that nature has to change. I mean, so we already have a, a, a contradiction with their theory of nature. Um, and it's just like, I mean, evolution, they say, uh, given enough time, would weed out the negative traits in man, and we should be at this point living in a utopian society. It's where we should be, right? Um, last time I checked the news, we're not living there. Uh, I mean, 
that, I mean, just, I mean, that shooting last week in Maine, um, 18 people. Uh, th this was huge in the deaf community. I don't know if you know this. There was three deaf men that were killed. Uh, one interpreter, actually, he was the interpreter for the governor. Um, uh, very well known in the deaf community over there. Three deaf men that were known, and actually, I know that they have friends that were here in the Portland area. Um, I mean, that's a huge impact for the deaf community. You, only, you say it's only three, but three is big. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you, you look at that and you go, and, and now they're saying that his family actually was telling the police that there was a problem. But you look at that, and then over the weekend, another eight shootings. Uh, that does not sound like utopia to me, okay? And, and according to evolution, we should be weeding out these things that, that are supposedly evil or wicked, which they don't believe in. That's just a, a construct of the mind, as we found out last week. It's not really true. Um, but anyway, so um, th here's the other thing um, in relation to salvation and evolution. You say, what? Wait a minute. Um, there are some people who kind of tie in this idea of evolution into salvation. Um, I actually have a friend that used to attend this church, and now he doesn't. Uh, he went off the rails. Um, sin's not your fault. It's a curse from God. Well, that's a misinterpretation or a misunderstanding of what Scripture is telling us, but he says sin is not your fault. Well, if sin's not my fault, I don't need salvation. Well, now we've got a problem. Okay, because that's not what the Bible teaches. Um, anyway, so you have nature, then you also have nurture. Um, John Locke, who's another philosopher, um, follows a philosophy called tabula rasa. Um, we all start as a blank slate, okay? And everything we are is determined by experience, okay? I don't disagree with that completely. I think we actually have a combination of both nature and nurture, okay? God created us. Okay, he created us the way we are, and then through environmental factors and the things we experience in life, we grow from that. Um, I kind of use this as an example. Nature made me five feet, four inches tall. Thanks. <laughs> but nurture has taught me to overcome my vertical challenges. It's nature versus nurture. Um, actually, there's another one I think is a great example. Uh, my dad. Um, I can't wait to see him in heaven. <laughs> my dad, nature made him deaf. Okay? Um, but through nurture and time and experience and life experiences, dad developed skills and abilities that, uh, to, to me, are astounding. Um, my, my dad was, is my hero. Or he was. He, he's still my hero. But um, my dad who was completely deaf, could hear absolutely nothing, okay? Loved to work on cars. Loved to work on cars. As a, teen, as a teenager, him and his friends would get out there, they'd build hot rods. Um, my dad took a 1940 Ford and put a 1954 Cadillac motor in it. Yeah, with a three-speed on the floor. Three speed. Oh, yeah. Um, sideways on the Hawthorne Bridge. He used to tell us the stories. But anyway, my dad could take a wooden dowel, it was about this long, Okay? He could put it on the motor, put his hand over the end of it, and he could tell you if the timing was off. He could tell you if there was a knock in the motor. And he could tell you which piston was knocking. That's nature versus nurture. You know, nurture taught him that. Nature made him deaf, but nurture overcame those things. So I think we have a combination of those things. So we got nature versus nurture. We also have what is called logic. Logic. Um, logic is the science of deriving truth through analysis of facts, either directly, which is deductively or indirectly. Indirectly, logic takes pre-given uh, presuppositions or ideas that analyze the relationships, compares them with other known factors, and arrives at a conclusion that identifies a previously unknown fact. <laughs> Another one of those definitions that hurts my brain. Basically, logic is math with ideas instead of numbers. Okay? Um, logic takes a known fact, couples it with another fact to come up with what is a reasonable conclusion. I was going to do something a little here. We, a little bit of math. One plus one equals two. Who said it? Yeah. I'm going to prove that. I'm going to prove that. Okay, so we know, or at least we've grown up being taught that one plus one equals two. Right? 
uh, but logic can be flawed if it's not used in accordance with given laws. Okay, I'm going to show. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you that 1 plus 1 equals 3. Okay? Let's assume A equals B. A equals B. Okay? Can we assume that? I'm not hurting any laws or anything like that, right? Okay? So A equals B. Um, let's take A um, equals B. Let's multiply both sides of A equals B. So A equals B. Let's multiply both sides by... Uh, B. So that gives us AB on this side and gives us B squared on this side. Are we good? Are we good with that? Okay, uh, so we're going to take AB equals B squared and now we're going to subtract both sides by A2 or 2A. A2, 2A, okay? So AB minus A2 equals B squared minus A2. Okay, it's okay. It's okay, I'm lost too. Yes, there will be a test at the end of the class. Um, so now we've, we've just subtracted both sides by A2. Now we're going to factorize both sides. We're going to factor it out to make it a little simpler. So we got this. We end up with now A times B minus A is equal to, uh, let's see, what was it? i got to look at my notes. Um, B minus A times B plus A. Okay, we've now factorized it. So far I'm still within the laws of math so far. Okay, everything's good. Okay. Now we're going to simplify both sides. So we simplify this out. Um, we actually end up with, by the time we simplify for everything, we end up with A is equal to B plus A. Huh. So hmm. let's add 1 to both sides. OK? Can we do that? We haven't changed any values yet, right? So now. We've already decided A is equal to B, right? And if A is equal to B, let's assume A equals 1. So if we plug in A, 1 plus 1 is equal to 1 plus 1 plus 1, which means 1 plus 1 is equal to 3. Can you do that with apples? Can you do that with apples, right? Here's the problem. I actually did break the laws of math. Okay? Yeah. And that's the problem with logic alone. Logic without a foundation or without rules fails. Okay? Um, so we have to take logic. I'm not saying logic is a bad thing. Actually, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, logic has value. Okay? Um, reasoning has value, so, but we come back to our question, so where do we get knowledge? Um, I believe, like I said, in a combination of nature and nurture, and God has built within us a desire to know. That's nature. Okay? Uh, Proverbs chapter 50, verse 14 says, The heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge. Okay? God has given us a desire to know. Okay? Um, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 5 says, A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 12, uh, Solomon wrote, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I gave my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God been given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. In other words, Solomon is saying, God has given us a desire to know things. That's not a bad thing. Okay, that's a good thing that we want to know things, especially when it comes to knowing God and knowing about creation and knowing about the things that are around us and knowing about relationships. Okay, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing to know things. Okay, uh, but where do we get the knowledge? That's the bigger question. Um, God has given us a brain. <laughs> he gave us a brain to reason, to use our senses, to assess our environment and to figure out how we fit into this cosmos. Okay. Um, knowledge we acquire really comes from three areas of study. Empiricism, which is our senses. Rationalism, which is reason or logic. Subjectivism, which is intuition. And that's all built around a foundation, which is revelation. Okay? 
That's the foundation where we start. I kind of gave you a little picture there. Revelation, basically, we're talking about the Word of God. See, evolution starts with nothing. They start with nothing. So where does knowledge come from? Well, at least we have a foundation for our knowledge. It's called the Word of God. Um, it's been established, okay? Um, so Revelation, or the foundation, we live in a time of information overload. They say that it's estimated on average a thousand new books are published every week. Wow, that's a lot of information. Uh, that doesn't include digital media. I mean, we're still talking about paper. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so our computers, our phones, our tablets, that doesn't even include that. And yet there's still a problem with a lack of understanding. American writer Saul Bellow said, information is we found daily papers. We are informed about everything, but we know nothing. Hmm. So where does all this confusion about a world you come from? Well, it's a lack of understanding the true nature of knowledge. Knowledge didn't develop on its own. Knowledge was given by God in Scripture. Okay? Hosea chapter 4, verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because thou hast rejected knowledge. I also will reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I also will forget thy children. Hmm. I look at that verse and I look around what's happening in our society. Uh, it's a little scary, you know? Um, <laughs> uh, there are days when I feel so sorry for my wife. <laughs> she works in a public high school. You would not believe the things she tells me on a daily basis. It's, it's public high school? Yeah, you see it. You see it, right? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, the thing she faces, which high school do you go to, by the way? It's brand new, it's two years old. Brand new, two years old, nice, okay. Yeah, uh, and she just transferred this year to a, a newer school, um, which is a little bit nicer, but seems to be more uh, woke. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so it's just like, well, what's the problem? Well, the, the, the problem is the lack of knowledge, true knowledge, okay? Um, the Bible warned us this was coming. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7 says, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, okay? Um, really, the problem comes down to this. The Bible's been rejected as the authority on knowledge and truth. So... Uh, Joseph Summer, American Humanist Association, says humanists reject the claim that the Bible is the Word of God. They are convinced that the book was written solely by humans in ignorant, superstitious, and cruel age. They believe that because the writers of the Bible lived in an unenlightened era, the book contains many errors and, and harmful teachings. <laughs> It says, if the humanist view of the Bible is correct, millions of Bible believers and churchgoers are wasting much time, money, and energy. Humanity's condition would be greatly improved if those resources were used for solving the world's problems instead of worshiping a non-existing God. Ooh, I got to take them to task on that one. You show me one person who's been improved based on humanistic propositions. Okay? You show me one, one way that the humanists have shown to improve society. Because it hasn't happened. Evolution has done nothing for us. Okay? This, this humanist idea that everything just evolves through nature and time and everything improves, they've done nothing for us. I mean, I, on the other hand, can point to a host of people whose lives have been miraculously transformed by a belief in a God that they call non-existent. Yeah. But I could show you evidence through lives changed, my, my own being one of them, okay? Uh, humanists would have written me off. They, they would have said that one, that, that, that was failed evolution. <laughs> yeah, thank God. Um, yeah, so it's just like, I mean, I, I could show you a whole host of people whose lives have been improved because of a belief in God, but they have no evidence that their humanism or their humanistic philosophies and perspectives actually work. Look at the homeless problem we have. What have they done to solve that? Nothing. Who feeds the homeless? The church. 
What has government done, which now, I mean, let's be honest, government is woke, okay? Uh, what have they done to improve the situation in people's lives? Absolutely nothing. Yeah, they've talked, okay? Um, they, they've created more problems. Yeah, it's just like, what was that, Bill? That's the only thing they're good at is talk. Um, it, this is actually years ago, H.A. Ironside. Um, was once uh, a, a, an agnostic, not an atheist, but an agnostic approached him and said, um, can we have a debate? Can we have a debate about your beliefs and my beliefs? And Ironside agreed, but he said, one condition, one condition. You bring one man and one woman who by your agnostic beliefs, their lives have been improved. Okay? You bring one man and one woman who will stand up and say, my agnostic beliefs have improved my life. You bring one and one, and I'll bring 100. And then we'll have a debate. Guess what happened? The agnostic walked off in a huff. Because he couldn't provide evidence that his belief worked. Okay? So where does knowledge come from? Well... Um, it comes from the Bible. We're living in a time when many are just falling for the belief the Bible is just another book, no true value, no true knowledge, and because of this belief, we're now seeing a famine of good Bible teaching, even in the church. Scripture warned us, again, <laughs> Amos chapter 8, verse 11 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing of the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east, and they shall run to and fro, seek the word of the Lord, and they shall not find it. Um, it pains me to say this. I have been in a Baptist church where the pastor didn't even bring a Bible to the pulpit. Not once did he quote Scripture. This was a Baptist church. I've been in, what does he have? Opinion. Stories. Now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to stories and illustrations, but you've got to have the Word of God. Um, uh, pretty sure Paul told Timothy, preach the Word. But we're at, we've got a famine in the land for true, good Bible preaching and teaching. Um, that's the problem. Without... The Bible for a foundation, for truth, everything else we have is speculation and theory. <laughs> That's a problem, because now I can come up with anything, any kind of a guess or a theory, and, and I don't have to have evidence to prove it. And people will believe it. I mean, you, you say something loud enough, long enough, guess what happens? Uh, you don't believe me? How about transgenderism? Say it long enough, loud enough, people start to believe it. And that's what's happening in our society. Well, that's the way they are. Well, we'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, the Bible's the only true authority we have for knowledge. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, For this cause also we thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. It's not a man's word, it is God's word, but they'll deny that to the end. Okay? Um, it is said of Thomas Jefferson that he hard time, had a hard time believing in the miraculous. Now, he, he, he believed the Bible, but he had a hard time believing in the miraculous, so he cut out the parts of the Bible that were miraculous. Well, now you've got a problem. You ain't got much Bible left. Um, it's God's Word. Um, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It is God's Word, and it is truth. Amen. And that's where we get knowledge. Okay, we have to have that foundation. Um, the Bible is the complete package. 
Uh, Psalm chapter 19, verses 7 through 11 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The command of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is their servant warned, and in keeping them there's great reward. Uh, I thought this was kind of interesting. Helen Keller said, knowledge is love, light, and vision. Now, does this mean that those other three areas are useless? No. Not at all. When you tie them to Scripture, they're actually um, beneficial to the Christian. Okay? Like I said, logic is good as long as it has a good foundational truth to base it on. But when you take away that truth, now you have a problem. Okay? Um, separate it from Scripture and these other ideas of where knowledge come from lead you to a path of destruction. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 says, There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Okay? So let's look at these three. Um, empiricism, which is our senses. Knowledge is based upon the five senses. Sight, sound, hearing. Wait a minute. Sight, sound, hearing. That was the same thing. What am I missing? Sight, sound, taste, touch. Smell. There it is. Smell. It's just like, whoo. Yeah, it's five senses. So by gathering data through our senses, so what we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we taste, what we touch, that's where we get knowledge. Uh, William Clifford said, It is wrong always, ever, and for anyone to believe anything upon insufficient evidence. <laughs> um, does science work? Well, here's the problem. Um, should science and the Bible be at opposite ends of the spectrum? No. No, not at all. Um, Ken Ham answers in Genesis says, the scientific method is grounded in the ideas of repeatability, falsifi uh, falsifiability, and testability. Each of these ideas assumes that there's a uniformity to the world that we live in. But on what grounds can we assume the world should operate in a uniform way? Only on the grounds that God has created the universe to function according to specific laws. Okay? Um, our failure isn't in science itself and trying to contradict science with religion. It's our misunderstanding of what science is. <laughs> science is not the nemesis of faith. Okay? Um, actually, science has been used to prove again and again the existence of God and the truth of the Bible. So the question is, what, is the, what does the word science really mean? Um, do you know that science was actually started by the church? Yep. The first scientists were all Christians, seeking to understand our universe. Nothing wrong with that. Um, the word science simply has this definition. I go back to Webster's 1828 Dictionary first. In a general sense, knowledge. That's what science means, knowledge. Certain knowledge. The comprehension or understanding of truth or facts by the mind. The science of God must be perfect. Okay? Um, words change over time. So science has changed a little bit, but words change over time. So if I had told you today on the way that I found my missing mouse in my briefcase. If I were to say that in 1947, <laughs> little different meaning, right? Yeah. Uh, my missing mouse would have been a little brown fuzzy creature. Yeah, with a long tail. Yeah, there's no tail on here. We are now wireless. Um, words change over time. Science is no different, but not as different as we might think. Webster's uh, Collegiate Dictionary from 2003 says the state of knowing. Well, that's the same thing. Knowledge is distinguished from ignorance or misunderstanding. Uh, but there's one problem with their definition. They left out God. Yep. They left out God. Scripture makes it clear that our senses are an important part of our role with understanding Scripture and of God. 
Uh, Psalm chapter 19, verse 1, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Our eyes, looking at nature, tells us there is a God. Okay? I, more, and more, I just, I, I, more and more scientists are, are looking at our universe and going, hmm, this evolution thing really doesn't work. Now, they don't want to call it God, but they are starting to lean more and more towards intelligent design, but they just can't figure out who the designer is. Well, we already know. Um, the heavens declare. Okay? Um, Psalm chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. I love these verses. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, then what does it say? What is man? That thou art mindful of him, and the son of man, that thou visitest him. I, 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 I read that. Bill, and it gives me chills. And here's why. When I consider the heavens and the work of his hands, everything that he created, and yet he still thinks of me. That gives me chills. That the creator of heaven, creator of everything we know, knows me personally. I'd much rather believe that than to believe that my ancestors either crawled out of the ocean, you know what I'm saying? Crawled out of the ocean or, or evolved from, I'd much rather think about a God that knows me personally. Man, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I read that verse and whenever I read it, it, it does, it just gives me chills. Especially when I think about where I came from. We don't deserve it. Science can deny all they want, but God says that we're without excuse. Okay? Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 19 says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You cannot look at nature and not see that there's a God. Um, some people want to say, well, you Christians, you have a blind faith. No, we, we don't. It's not a blind faith. It, it's a faith based upon evidence. Okay? Well, answer prayer, but, I, no, but I mean, even more, it, it's based upon what we see. It's based upon what we know because it's been recorded for us. 1 John chapter 1, verse three, 1 through 3 says, That which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, that which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life, they saw, they heard, and they touched Jesus Christ. Amen. That's evidence. That's not a blind faith. I've moved from teaching into preaching because that just gets me fired up. It's not a blind faith. I've got evidence. I have eyewitness proof that Jesus came to this earth, he died upon the cross, he was buried, and he rose again for my salvation. It's not a blind faith. It's a faith based upon the Word of God, and it's based upon evidence, eyewitness evidence. What do they have? A theory. And they can't prove it. Um, it says, for the life was manifested. We've seen it and we bear witness and show unto you the eternal life which was with the Father was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowships with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. It's not a blind faith. It's through testimony and knowledge of others that the gospel message has been passed down for generations and is still being passed down. Uh, we were talking a little bit in, in the auditorium before we came. God's moving. God is moving. I mean, we're seeing people saved. We're seeing kids in the school. We're seeing kids in Joy Club. We're seeing teenagers get saved every week. God is moving. Okay? Um, and, and it's based upon knowledge from the Word of God. So we have empiricism, which is based on the things that we can, our senses, what we see, hear, taste, touch, okay? Um, then we have reason. <laughs> Logic. 
Knowledge is based upon certain principles, which we know apart from what we experience through our senses. These rules, notice that, these rules govern our thinking. Laws of logic are examples of these rules. So, what they're saying is when we know the rules, we can reason our way to knowledge. <laughs> That's where I went. Who made the rules? Who made the rules? I mean, who made these rules of logic that we're supposed to be following? I mean, because if we're, we're talking about evolution, we're talking about a pool of ooze that got struck by lightning. Where the lightning came from, we don't know. Where the pool of ooze came from, we don't know. But now, all of a sudden, this is what we're supposed to base our laws of logic on? Our reasoning is based upon nothing? Who makes the rules? It relies heavily on our ability to analyze information to come to a conclusion. Well, Rene Descartes says, I think, therefore I am. No, 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 no. I am, therefore I think. He's got it backwards. I am because God created me. And because that he created me and he breathed into me the breath of life and I became a living soul is what the Bible teaches and now I can think. There's the rules. Okay, so they've got it backwards. I mean, from that rationale, he developed a system of knowledge. Here's the problem again. Who makes the rules according to them? Well, logic without a foundation has a problem. Big problem. Uh, we've discussed this earlier. Man has decided that in the case of a pregnancy, the fetus basically has no rights. And it all falls to the woman and her decision to do what she wants with her body. Have you seen the bumper stickers, keep your laws off my body? Has anybody taken into consideration the baby that's in her? What about the baby's rights? Okay, well, they, they don't believe that. Yeah, they, they, they don't call it abortion, by the way. They call it women's health. Hmm. But here's the problem with their logic. Okay, they're saying, well, it's not really a life yet. That's why they call it a fetus. They don't want to call it a baby. Because if you call it a baby, then it's... A life. So we call it a fetus so we could excuse our behavior. But anyway, so they call it a fetus and this is their logic. Well, if it's a fetus, it's not really a life, then it's not murder. That's their logic. But it is an animal. It is considered so an animal. It is considered, yeah, in animals. Um, but th this is their logic, okay? So, but, but their logic doesn't have consistency. Okay? So, so if you abort a baby, it's not murder. Okay? But if you have a pregnant woman who is murdered by someone, they're charged with two counts of murder. But wait, it's a fetus, it's not a baby. Why are we being charged with two counts of murder? You have failed logic. You see that? It's failed logic. It doesn't work without a foundational truth. All life belongs to God. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. <laughs> uh, I, I love shocking the fourth graders. Fourth graders can be tough. They can be mean to each other. And I told them today, I said, you are all beautiful in God's eyes. And they're like, what? What? No, what? No, no. In God's eyes, we're all beautiful because we are created in his image. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Nobody gets to tell you different. Okay? I am fearfully and wonderfully made. What's that? Even at five foot four. Even at five foot four, that's right. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Um, fur further problems with their logic. Let's, 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 let's take it a little deeper. So, you're going to love this subject. COVID. So, when COVID came out, as they were developing this vaccine, they kept telling us what? Trust the science. Trust the science. That's what they kept telling us, right? And now they're saying, uh, don't trust the science. Okay? Uh, don't trust the science. But they kept saying, follow the science. Follow the science. Trust the science. Look at what the science tells us. Pharmacologists were telling us, look at the science that was used to create these vaccines. Look at the science. Back to this idea of the transgender. 
Okay? The argument has been made that biologically they are either male or female. That's what we believe. God created male, female, right? But now they're telling us, they're telling us, oh no, no. Ignore the science of biology. Wait a minute. So for a vaccine, you're telling me to follow the science. But when it comes to biology, you're telling me ignore the science. How does that logic work? Well, there's a contradiction there. And anytime there's a contradiction, something is flawed. Okay? Something's flawed. Um, but here's the idea. They'll give this big old long argument how that when we are conceived, we all have both genders. And actually that's true. But at some point in a fetus development, it picks one way or the other, male or female. The percentages that are born with both are so minute. Okay? So they're telling you, ignore the science. Um, the logic doesn't work. Okay? Uh, gender's not a choice. I don't get to choose what I am. I was born this way. I was made this way. I was fearfully and wonderfully made this way. Okay? Uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, for God created man in his own image, in the image of God created him, male and female, created he them. So should Christians avoid logic? Oh no, no, no. We have to use logic to reveal truth. Acts chapter 17, verse 2, Paul said, uh, it says, And Paul, as his manner was, went into them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. That word reasoned is the key. If you look back at the original dialogue, uh, the Greek word is hmm, uh, D-I-A-L-E-G-O-M-A-I, -E D-I-A-L-E-G-O-M-A-I. We get our word dialogue from that word. So, let dialogue. So let's sit down and have a dialogue. But actually, when you actually break it down, it's a compound word. It means to lay alongside. So take this evidence and lay it alongside of each other, and let's look and compare. Let's look at the Word of God and what it says and compare with what we think we believe. Okay? So it's good to discuss these things. When you break it down, I mean, our idea of apologetics comes from this. Um, we're making a defense for our faith and belief using logic. But here's the thing, we have a foundational truth. And that's why logic works for us. It doesn't work for them. Their logic contradicts and it fails. So logic is good. Um, Tim Keller says, all regions of philosophy say, this is the way. Only Jesus says, I am. Um, <laughs> I thought this was kind of funny. Glenn Scribner says, Christians believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. Materialists believe in the virgin birth of the cosmos. Choose your miracle. Logic. Is it logical to believe that just out of nothing, everything appears? It's too complicated. Well, it's, it's, it's actually really simple because it doesn't work. Um, so we've got uh, empiricism, which is our, our senses. We've got a logic, which is, um, yeah. We come to subjectivism, which is intuition, your gut. Okay? Knowledge of any absolute truth is impossible. All we can know is what's true for ourselves. Ooh. Well, we already got a problem. We can only know what's true for ourselves. Uh, reason and logic can be hazy. Senses deceive. We just know things. It's just my gut tells me. We got a problem already. Man left to his own decision making and determination is in a world of hurt. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 12. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Uh, Walt Whitman said, whatever satisfies the soul is truth. Ooh. Whew. That's not good. Uh, intuition can be dangerous. Intuition relies a lot on experience, but in the end, it fails without truth to back it up. Okay? 
to kind of use this as an example. So a man goes to a craps table, shooting dice. You're all looking at me like, what? <laughs> My background, hey, I was a sinner until I was 26 years old until I finally got saved. I know about these things. No, you go to a craps table, you're shooting dice, okay? He shoots the dice. Now he's got to get an 11. He's got to match the number that he rolled the first time. Well, he got an 11 the first time, so now he's got to match another 11. So he's looking at it, he's got an 11. So he shakes those dice, and he shakes them really hard. And he throws the dice. No 11, he's got a 4. Fail. Next turn around, throws the first set, and he gets a 3. So the second time, he's got to get a 3. He just goes like this. He barely shakes them at all. He throws them like this. He's thinking that to get a bigger number, I've got to shake them harder. But if I want a little number, I've got to shake them softer. If I got a bigger number, I got to shake him harder. But if I got a little number, I can shake him a lot. It's just like he falsely believes he can control the dice. Okay? I, was this based on past experience? <laughs> Did he happen one time when he rolled at 11 and the second time he threw him really hard and he got an 11? So he's basing this on experience? Well, wait a minute. That's gut. You're going to have a problem. But what, what, if, what if the experience in a man's life are bad? Does that mean he's doomed? I, I don't say this boastfully. I started using drugs at 12 years old. 12. And I was addicted till I was 26 years old. And I praise God I never spent a day in jail. I was a functional drug addict. I went to work. I had a job. I had a family. People looked at me and said, doomed. Experience says, doomed. It's not what God says. Gut feeling? Sean Nolan says, intuition's like a book of matches. We can use the tool to warm a house or burn it down. See, we may have an intuition, but is it according to the knowledge and indwelling of the Holy Spirit? What does that mean? Uh, How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. Whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Um, Gut feeling is compared to Holy Spirit leading. Um, What do you got to do? You got to ask God to give you wisdom. Give me guidance, Lord. Help me to understand what I need to see or what I need to learn or what I need to do. Um, And and God told us to ask. Matthew chapter 7 says, Ask, it shall be given unto you. Seek, you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asks receives, and he that seeks finds, and him that knocketh it shall be opened. I mean, I think the great example in the Bible, and we kind of attribute this to Solomon and Solomon alone. God asked Solomon, what do you want? What a request. What do you want, Solomon? There was no limitation put on that question. Read it, read it for yourself. Go back and look. There was no limitation put on that request. God asked him, what do you want? And in 1 Kings it says, Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart. Because it says, I want wisdom, Lord. I want to be able to, to know. I want to be able to judge rightly. I want to be able to. And God says, Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there's none like thee before thee, neither shall there have to be any arise like unto thee. Wait a minute, can I ask for wisdom? Actually, the Bible tells me I can. James chapter 1 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given unto him. But let him ask in faith, not wavering, for he that wavers like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Hey, you got to believe that he's going to give you an answer. One of the things that we, we are given as Christians and with the Holy Spirit's power is discernment. If we'll just seek him and his wisdom. Um, 
Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1, My son, thou wilt receive my words, hide thy commandments with thee, so that thou incline thy heart unto wisdom, apply thy heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and lifteth thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for as hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. There it is, the knowledge of God. Uh, Holy, Holy Spirit prompting versus gut feeling. Um, about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, about three weeks ago, school got out. We still had some kids on property, and there happened to be a homeless guy standing on the far side of the parking lot. And he was fixing his bicycle. And so we still got kids here, so we wanted to usher him off the property. We didn't know. And so me and Andrew went out, and we talked with him. Uh, his name was David. Um, and he was nice. He was really nice. He was just trying to fix his bike and everything. He didn't have the tools and everything. I said, well, so I told him, I said, well, I got some tools in my car. Why don't you come up front? We'll go up there. We're just trying to get him towards the front of the property. But at the same time, we want to be able to share Christ with him, you know. So we brought him up to the front, pulled out my tools, started helping him fix his bike. We were kind of taking things apart, putting things together. And this whole time, Andrew's witnessing to this kid. I mean, he was young. He probably mid to late 20s. And so Andrew was kind of witnessing to him, and I was talking to him and things like that. He admitted some things to us. He said he, you know, he, he struggled with depression. He was homeless, been homeless for a long time. Um, his mother had recently passed away. And then he flat out admitted that he had an addiction to drugs. I don't share my testimony about my drug addiction too often with strangers. I just don't. Um, but the Lord led me to just... Tell him, hey, you know, David, you can be freed from that addiction. I said, I know, because I've been freed. Now, the whole time we were talking with him, Andrew was talking, he was trying to give him scripture, and was trying to give him an invitation. We invited him to come to church. The whole time, his head was down, he's working on his bike. He's trying to fix the bike. He's doing this, right? He, he would not, he, no eye contact. He would not look at us, okay? But the moment I said, hey, you can be free from that addiction, I know, because I've been freed. He did this. I don't share that with people, not with strangers. But this, at this point, I just felt like the Lord was telling me, tell them what you've gone through. And he looked up. And I think there was a, a seed planted in his mind that day that maybe will grow. I don't know. Now, he, he thought he was saved. Of course, he thought he was saved. You know, we asked him, are you going to heaven? Well, I think so. You know, it's like, well, no, you could know so. Intuition, no, Holy Spirit leading. But they work together. So where does knowledge come from? God. It's God that gives us knowledge. Now we incorporate that thing with all the other things, with our senses, with logic, and with our gut. It's not a bad thing, okay? Um, and that really influences our worldview. I mean, it's just like that's why we see and that's why we believe the things that we believe is because of what the Bible tells us. That's the foundation right there. It's the foundation for all knowledge. You got to have rules. We do. Got to have rules for logic. We have them. Got to have a, a, a reason for your senses. Well, we have that too. It's all so that we could share Christ. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts uh, and be ready always to give an answer of the hope that's within you. Ah, with what? Your senses, your logic, and your gut. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Word of God. We thank you that you've given us a foundation in the Word. That's the foundation for our knowledge. It all comes from you. Lord, I pray that you would just bless this time now. We thank you uh, just for the interaction and for the opportunity to be in your house, to be able to learn together. Lord, I thank you so much just for uh, a place to serve. Uh, most importantly, I thank you for your gift of salvation. Lord, thank you for thinking of me. As the Bible says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Lord, you thought of us. When Jesus was on that cross, he was thinking of us. When he died and shed his blood for our sins, it was for us. And Lord, I pray you help us not to forget that, not to get over it. But Lord, what a blessing to know that. And I pray that you bless in Jesus' name. Amen. Ah, homework. Uh, each worldview has a distinct take on goodness and morality, ethics. 
Uh, where do we get our morality from? The world will say that it just evolved over time. Of course it did. So we'll talk about that the next time. Amen.